talk to you this morning a little bit about is this a better place and things that I have seen being on the road probably for the last four years, about 70% of the time, and being in community, and also coming from a community that is also in a lot of pain. Um, and so I want to push a little, share perspectives, and invite you to, don't have to own anything that I'm saying, I'm just sharing a point of view and asking you to join me in thinking about a different way. So when I think about, is this a better place, I often get angry initially. And I get angry because I often feel like people are asking that question without ever really done doing the investment to be able to ask that question. And I get afraid, I get angry, because it's usually a proxy to further design opportunity out of community. And it's a very dangerous question if we allow others to frame it. And so that's why I'm excited about this notion of evaluation in place today, because there's a lot of work that we have to do. And so to start, I wanted to start with, is this a better place? Absolutely, it is a better place. In many communities, things are improving. But they're improving at a scale that is not satisfactory. And that scale problem is, in many cases, a problem of how we design the work. We're talking about evaluation when we talk about it as, a, as in a better place, usually in terms of social indicators. And I really do get excited about social indicators because there's an interest that I always hold now when I do my work, and that is the interest of the population. And if you don't get anything else today, I'm asking you, I'm inviting you to think about holding the interest of an entire population. Because when you hold the interest of an entire population, you enter the room radically differently, as opposed to thinking about 500 folks, 100 folks, 1,000, et cetera. I hold the interest of being accountable for trying to improve the lives of entire populations. I at least want to start the conversation there. Because what happens in the community setting context is we start projecting our fantasies into the initiative. And the fantasy is that the social indicator will improve. So I'm like, great, if we're going to fantasize, let's at least try to get close to making it happen. And in order to make that happen, then we need to have a different conversation around how do we structure the work in community and in place. And to me, that's where often the breakdown is. So I'm going to try to give you some real tangible ways in which we do that, um, and we see other communities doing it. But I'm asking you seriously to hold that interest of population level accountability. When I say you hold the interest, it means that when you enter the room, you no longer allow the conversation that was a social indicator conversation to evolve into just a programmatic. You don't let it devolve into just doing good work. Now, it doesn't mean that sometimes we, gotta, we have to just do the programmatic work and then fight another day. It doesn't mean I negotiate the interest the way. That's where the savviness and the judgment of your leadership comes into play. But when you hold the interest of population, there's a couple of things that will happen. First, when it comes to evaluation and change, we've got to do some work that hasn't been done in place-based work in a long time. And that is the uncomfortable work of talking about structures that were designed to design opportunity out of community. We need to talk about race. We need to talk about class. We need to talk about culture. And we need to talk about gender. So when I think about what's the muscle that we got to build to be able to hold population level accountability, it's those things that we got to do. And that is the scariest thing because we often want to enter the room and sanitize it. And when you sanitize the room, that's why you can immediately evolve into a programmatic response when there's a structural problem in play. And ladies and gentlemen, programs will always be trumped by structure. Initiatives will always be trumped by structure. And in too many cases, we're framing the right work, we're talking about it in the right way, and our actions are woefully inadequate for the task. And then we have the audacity to come back and evaluate. <laughs> and that's the malpractice, quite frankly. Because our political opposition doesn't even do anything but just watch us tear ourselves apart. Because the game is never structured in the first place to win. And so if you want to start in a place that I think is the most special place to start if we're going to really take place based work to the next level, it's to start by owning the pain that community members are. 
To me, population accountability is about me feeling the pain that they own and trying to relieve it. So I don't need to actually go into communities and spend six months worrying about what to do. All I need to do is talk to folks. So often we get in a room and we can't figure it out. And it's arrogant of us to continue to struggle without the folks in the room who already have the answer and telling you what to do. All I need you to do, and all I need to do, is to pick one result, one measure of progress, and get going on it at scale. Because quite frankly, until I do that, I haven't done anything. But when I do do that, I do develop the muscle to take on more complex work. And there's a couple of things that I'm asking you to think about here, which is really the work that we have to do. I always tell folks, I'm excited about the time that I entered the space in the 90s, but I was always also frustrated because all the easy stuff had been done. And it's even more so now. We've done the program stuff, we've done the initiative stuff, you read Voices from the Three, we've got great amount of analysis of this sector. Now the question is, what will we do? So when I'm at home and I'm really struggling and thinking about what to do, the thing I get most excited about is why I was talking about my idealism is because we're at a place in our nation where we can no longer hide talking about the structural problems in the community. It is our work. We've got foundation leaders in this room, we've got practitioners who actually do know how to talk about race and class and culture and gender. So we're not absent of having the muscle to do this work. Now the question is, do we have the commitment? So I'm going to try to walk you through a very practical way in which I try to hold population level accountability to do something different. This is where I do like collective impact. Because collective impact forces you to think about one thing. How do we get around a shared agenda that is too big for any one of us in this world? That's a frustrating place for me to be because I hate process and I hate just the group thing. But when you hold the interest of populations, you realize you don't actually have an alternative. You need folks. So even if your ego doesn't allow you, if you're a little bit emotionally, intelligently deficient, <laughs> you don't have a choice. And it's a great pressure to be in, to actually be able to enter a room and know that no matter how I feel about the folks there, our fates are inextricably bound, bound by a powerful result. And so I hold population accountability by always figuring out what's the number that we're talking about. I actually don't enter conversations anymore until we're clear on the number. Because when I'm talking about the number, it starts setting in motion a chain of events around what we're trying to build. So even as I lead the Promise Neighborhoods work, it's radically different talking about a programmatic approach to Promise Neighborhoods and figuring out what will the Promise Neighborhoods contribution be to the 14 million children in poverty in America. You see the difference? The anxiety goes way up. So when we think about the 61 communities, we're not in a conversation about programmatic work anymore. We're in a conversation about how do we take the entry point of the programmatic work and use it to leverage crafting the right mix of solutions to get to scale. When I talk about the right mix of solutions, we're talking about solutions that include families being engaged deeply, high quality programs, policies and systems work. And I guarantee you, you go to a place and you do not see a healthy mix of that and no one can tell you what the number is, we got some huge flaws. And what's important is it still doesn't mean good work isn't going. That's the insidious cancer of it all. It doesn't mean that good work still isn't happening even if you can't declare that. But what it means is we're actually not learning. What it means is we actually haven't learned how to move forward. And so when I join, I hold the interest of population, even if I'm not on the ground, right now I don't sit on the ground, I sit at a national organization, but it doesn't give me an excuse for not holding accountability. You can still sit, even as evaluators, you can sit and ask these questions and set the conversation in motion. So I'm holding population level accountability. And then I'm also holding, can we get the group to accelerate, to declaring something big that they want to work on? One or two or three results. Of course we know we have to do more complex stuff. But the complexity is woven in all the big problems anyway. It's rare that you can take one result and just deal with it all in isolation. So if you can pick one or two really big things in a community, you will really be able to rock the boat. 
and then can we figure out a way to measure our progress over time? Now this is the piece where I think the evaluations have a great opportunity to help us hold, hold us accountable for doing this work. Population, result, indicators. It's usually at this point that things start evolving. Things start evolving because rarely do we do the discipline work of trying to figure out why an indicator is really trending in a particular direction. And what does it really take to get it moving in the next direction? We start satisfying really quickly in this regard. I feel like the problem is daunting. We start doing initiatives and programs. And quite frankly, folks, I believe this now. If the money's not on the table on the front end, and if folks aren't committed on the front end, it ain't gonna happen. Because our attention span is three or four years in and out. And so what I'm talking about is the need to accelerate more quickly because the capital isn't structured to hang in there any longer. And so it makes it more important to get into this work quickly and be able to deal. So we need to be able to land the result, land the indicator, really figure out what it takes to get that indicator trending in the right direction. And then we need to do what I think is probably the most important and the most exciting part of population level accountability. It is requiring folks to have admission into a room, what we would call a container, because they have a contribution. If you don't have a contribution, you don't get in the room. It's amazing what happens when you move to have contribution conversations versus people who are really intoxicated by constantly describing a phenomenon. That is not the work. And so the admission is to come to the room with a contribution, even families. You don't come in and you don't have a contribution. Families have a role to play. And if you really want to engage the community, hold them to the same standard you hold everyone else, which is to own something. It's very patronizing simply to hold community meetings, feed folks, and report out. And they never own anything. So part of our own leadership is to say that the price of admission is a contribution. That is also a way of level setting the power dynamics in the room without ever having to argue about how. It is to say that everybody enters this room with an equal contribution, it just may manifest in different ways. And once we can talk about your contribution, then we can talk about the targets. How much of that number do you own over how, what period of time? That's the work. And that should be the work of evaluative leaders and all of us, quite frankly, on the front end before we do anything. Because that's where we should have the fights. That's where we should have the power struggles. That is the work of our time, to begin to figure this out. Imagine talking about policy changes and advocacy for which people don't want to pay for. Well, you're not going to get the structural change if you don't take on systems work and policy work. You just can't. And you're certainly not going to get it if the investors don't structure the capital to allow you to do that work. That's just the reality. And so what I'm trying to signal is the signal is not a critique of our system, but laying out the honest barriers that keep us from really doing the substantive work that must be done. And our job now is to figure out how to have the conversations over and over and over, pushing and pushing and pushing until we start getting some breakthroughs in terms of how the capital is structured, how, do we, how we relate to each other, how we're going to define success. How do we raise the right level of anxiety on the front end instead of trying to save face on the back end? Because we were never committed to the right work in the first place. And that is not a critique. It is an honest assessment of where we're going to be. If I don't own the population, I am doing good work. But I'm not doing necessarily new work. We already know how to do that. So the marker going forward has to be that everyone in this room can hold the interest, the pain, the frustration, the hopes and aspirations of communities where opportunity has been designed out. And that we can be bold enough to begin to design it back in. And we can act like we don't, we're not afraid to talk about race. That is our work. And there are ways in which we can talk about it without beating people up, but still holding people accountable. There are ways we can talk about contribution and expect people to actually deliver on it. The structure of accountability is really what I'm talking about here. And it starts with us how we enter the room, not with this imaginary governance structure. 
It starts with how we show up and what we're willing to fight for every single day. I often tell people where I sit right now, I can just fly around the country and talk all day long. People would love that. And they'd have me come out to the event and do more and more, but that actually isn't a result, folks. That is not a result. A result is for me to use the privilege that I have to push an agenda, a set of results, and to link my faith with those folks on the ground. Now, that's what's scary. When you hold populations of accountability, what you're holding is the same fate as everyone else, and you don't have the luxury of weaseling out of it. And that is hard, because for funders, for nonprofits, for intermediaries, what it means is you really do not have any control. For well, the reality is we never did it in the first place. Now we're simply declaring it and linking our faith with what really matters, our contribution to a big problem that is too big for any one of us, that's too complex for any one of us. And magical things will happen when we do that. So when we think about place, I'm asking you to think about holding the interest of the population. Actually begin to bring a discipline to your work. The interest of the population is one step forward. A discipline to your work is the second. So on my team, if folks can't tell me the discipline by which they're going to go into a community meeting and the team they're going to be, they need to stay home. And I really mean that, folks. If you can't launch a community process and have master, te master techniques, you need to stop. In our case, we use results based accountability. Some folks can use Six Sigma, others may have something else that they use. But if you're still coming through this work with raw talent, it is the problem. Because you need to be more skilled in just showing up and talking. You've got to have the capacity to move the group from talk to action in a way that actually gets rid of impact. I always equate it to have me on a sports team. It doesn't matter how good the talent is can't get them to work together. And that's what we're trying to do by bringing greater discipline to our work. Can we get folks to run the offense and defense that we want them to run? In this context, can we get folks to do the work that needs to be done to get results at scale? And that doesn't happen simply because you have call some meetings and put some flip chart paper up on the walls. That's not discipline. So hold the population. Begin to figure out what is the discipline your networks are going to use. And then, this notion of adaptive work. We don't actually know the answers when we set out on these big scale efforts. And so what that means is we've got to have a lot of room for failure and a lot of room for learning, and our evaluation needs to be designed to do that. Think about it. Adaptive work by its nature says, I don't know the answer, and I'm going to start a journey. And so at best, our result, our indicator, and our contributions are really kind of guides to a place that we want to go. They should change. They probably won't be right. And that should be okay. And that should be okay. Because the reality is, we don't know what we're doing. And we're gonna use a disciplined way to start figuring it out. And we actually don't know how long it will take. And this folks is a place where we've gotta stop really setting up our field in a bad way. Our field has learned that everything should happen in three to five years. And yet, we're not structured to deliver on anything major in three to five years. It takes us three to five years just to start talking to each other. It really does, folks. And the reason for that is because we actually don't build a lot of infrastructure in this sector. So every time we start something new, we've got to rebuild infrastructure. So as it relates to place, what I'm asking you to consider after you got the population interest, you got the discipline, is how do we begin to build common infrastructure so that we can ramp up, ramp off, and keep running? Because you can't say three to five years if it takes you two to three to rebuild the infrastructure from the last initiative because you stopped funding it. And now you've got a whole new set of people who don't even know how to use that infrastructure. All of these things are things that we can fix easily. It's not like we don't have the money. It's not like we don't have really good institutional leaders, but if you ask these executive directors what's the problem, they'll tell you, you keep starting new stuff when I already was doing the right work. You just want to call it something different. <laughs> Folks, the work of our time is not sexy. It is housing, it is jobs, it is crime. It is the same stuff that it has always been. You can call it what you like. 
but until we learn to get results at scale, you're not particularly being intellectually on the leading edge of anything. And we just have to accept that. That's the, this is the moment in, that we are in. We can do great work together. We can evaluate this work in a way that tells the story about what we're learning and what it takes. That's the story I would love to see. The story that situates the challenge in the right context. Without that, without that, we are doing a disservice to the population who keeps hanging in there with us every single time we start this stuff. Every single time we raise their hopes and aspirations and somehow or another we find a way to start walking back. We don't have to walk it back anymore. We don't have to walk it back. The reason why I'm still excited with my job is because it's an expectation that I'm going to try to deliver on population level results. It's an expectation that I'm going to talk about race, class, culture. If I don't, I'm probably going to get fired. Because that is the work of equity. <laughs> so and I don't really know what I would be doing at Policy Link if I wasn't doing that. And that is all of our work, no matter how we want to call it, no matter how we want to finesse it. Our job is to figure out the right way to do it within the context that is comfortable for us. But it is to have those conversations. It is to do this work. And when you do this work, and you think about place-based work in terms of people, place, and economy, and your solutions are aligned to connect the hopes and aspirations of people with a place that is full of opportunity, that is linked to a broader economy, we will be right. Well, first of all, we'll be on the vanguard of a new wave of place-based work. But we'll be coming back to rooms like this celebrating the huge impact that we're having. So I'm inviting you to join me on this journey of thinking about how do you walk into a room holding the interest of the people that you're privileged to serve? How do you do it by bringing greater, greater discipline to this work? And how do you start demanding that the capital be structured so that you can do the right work for this time? And lastly, I'm asking you not to settle for doing good work. All of us have built wonderful careers off of doing good work. Unfortunately, it's not the work that the people that I know in the community want me to do. I know each and every one of you have too many gifts to quite frankly be mediocre. To quite frankly be mediocre. That's not why we signed up to do this. So as you think about evaluation, Think about place. Don't see them as two things that are radically separate. See them as an exciting opportunity to hold an interest and take the work to a new level. And then to help people understand what does it take for us to do this work right now. And when we do that, we really will have a society for talking, which is a major possible. So thank you. Stuff that we are doing. 
programmatically. And so to me, you want to start leveling the power dynamics, you start making the same accommodations that folks who want to get you and myself to come, come to things, they can for us. When we just start, when we start designing processes and solutions that look like how people live their lives, watch the impact of the Does that help you? So when you start doing your budgets, you should be thinking about how do I have a budget that reflects sharing power and sharing resources with the people who are in community. Yes, ma'am. People interested in doing this work together should start from a place that is comfortable for them. And so I wanted to give you the opportunity to, because you and I talk, and I know that by comfortable, you don't mean, uh, well, I won't even say what you don't mean. I just would <laughs> ask you, I would ask you for some clarification about what you mean by I'm sorry. That. Right. So when I'm talking about comfortable, First thing I'm talking about, I'm always walking into the room uncomfortable about because of the interest that I'm holding. When I'm talking about comfortable, I'm talking about comfortable getting started doing the tough work. So I'm gonna to have to find my own voice around equity. Angela's got her voice around equity. It's not mine. I'm never gonna get a stronger voice around equity if I don't talk about it. I'm never gonna get a stronger voice around race if I don't talk about it. The only way you find your own old job is by doing the work yourself. And so comfort means Starting with wherever you're at and accepting that that is okay. It's not good enough. It's good enough to get started. But you shouldn't beat yourself up. You're gonna make a lot of mistakes. I think every talk that I give is horrible right now. Because I'm still trying to find my rhythm around equity and this work. It's not gonna get better if I stay in my human, right? If I hide from doing this, right? And so this is a perfect example. As I'm playing back my remarks in my hand, I was like, man, dude, you should have said it this way, you should have said that. But I'm never gonna get my rhythm if I don't just wait until it, right? And so comfort for me is being comfortable enough to accept what you, the current skill set you have and to begin modeling you in the work and then continuing to let your um, investment in yourself enough professionally that your skill set will then catch up to where you want to be. Yes, Hi, Michael. Thank you again for challenging this. The question to you is the time for an absolute concur with your thought, and that also is a consistent reflection. So how do you take this um, population base, this um, the outcome, the share agenda and all that, and you um, help turn this huge structure of the system to not um, major reaction? So since we're doing the promised neighborhoods and we're looking at outcomes, of course, they want immediate, major change in the you know. So, tell us what your perspective is on that, because that's a huge player. So, so we actually have more power than we actually use in the sector. We are masters at framing stuff. We just have to frame this issue. So the first thing is, I don't answer those questions anymore. I mean, if, if you don't own a contribution and I'm not joining you in the work, I'm not talking to you about results. You see, my, I don't do that. Why would I have a conversation with folks who want to know something that they're not invested in? I'm setting myself up and I'm setting them up to learn something really bad. I can only tell you what it takes when I'm in a community, when I'm in a particular place, not a general place, when I'm in a specific place. I understand the politics, I understand the barriers, I understand the capital that's committed, and I actually understand the capacity of folks to do the work. All those things come into play. And so when people say, how long does it take? I don't know. That is the honest answer. I actually don't know until I see. It's like when you hire people in your office. You may hire someone who you think is an absolute star only to discover that they can't actually run as fast as you thought. Doesn't mean they won't get there, but it means there's a little bit of work we've got to do with them. And so for me, we've got to frame. Structural and policy changes take a long time. And we've got plenty of analogs that we can use out there to look at that. Those are not short wins. Sometimes you get a political anomaly. That's not, and we can still measure ourselves. See, to me, I still have a, even when I'm taking the long view, I still have the contributions, the targets annually to start talking about marking progress. So what I could say to someone who asked that question is, let me show you the contributions people are making. We can have a conversation around contribution. 
But again, remember, if you're not really dealing with the structural and policy stuff, everything you're doing is going to be Trump anyway. That's why I don't know. And I'm not afraid to say that. And the sooner we can get more real about that, especially in the proposals that we write, the sooner we can change the dominant logic in the sector. Because I can tell you, the proposals that you write are being used against you in Congress. That's our fault. That is our fault. Many of us are there advocating all the time, and we're not framing what does it take to do good place-based work right now. And our job is to get out in front of issues like this so that we actually can lead the way we want to and not be at the mercy of folks who aren't deep, deep in the work enough to actually know how to do it. So I, don't, I understand why people ask those questions, but my job is to help people understand that it's, it's the start of a conversation around really when you understand the business. And what you hear me pushing back on is, I actually resent folks who don't want to understand the business of community, but they want to jump to and tell me what it takes to get it done. That's insulting. How many of you all, every day, have people skip over trying to understand your business? But they want to tell you how to do it. <laughs> I just choose that. I know I can't win that. So I just choose not to play. I don't have a personality that is conducive for it. So <laughs> that's why I don't answer the question. So I don't say something that I'm going to truly regret. One last question. I have the mic. It's me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your remarks. Um, so you talked about you know the work that we do is unsexy jobs, etc. And also the need to invest in infrastructure, which is arguably even less sexy than that. Um, and you know we're dealing with this three to five time period for investment when we know that it does take a lasting investment in community infrastructure to achieve results. So how do you, you kind of just answered it, but a little bit more on how we deal with that contradiction. So the first is probably part of how you take up your own leadership. So I'll give you a good example. The, the Promise Neighborhood for example, is a good model of how the federal government has really rocked meaning in a different way and how funders work with us differently. When we started the, the, the Thomas Neighborhoods Institute, I used actually voices from the field three to really figure out what would my work mean to add value. That's an asset. That's an asset, of course. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and so the first thing we decided was, you know what, I can't actually hold a results framework if we can't see our data. So instead of having people go out and spend millions of dollars on data systems, we just bought the licenses for two market leading pieces, ETO and the results scorecard, and we paid for them to talk together. That saved our network more than $3 million a year, took the ramp up time from three, months to three, from three years to six months. Now that is an example where if we expressed a point of view, we said it's stupid to actually not actually know how to do cradle to career work, and at the same time we're trying to figure that out, we're gonna become software developers, when there's perfectly good stuff out there. So part of this is you gotta be willing to hold a point of view about the work and stop being so neutral on everything and call stupidity what it is. You got three to five years to get results and you're gonna build a data system that'll take you three. Does that make sense? And then you'll get mad if Congress comes back and hammers the federal program. And so that is an example of the infrastructure. Now that we've got that infrastructure, We've got the Urban Institute and others who are helping us look at an impact report every month. So we can actually start asking more rigorous questions like, we're seeing too many um, children that are not classified by gender, and or we're, we're seeing too many children that aren't linked to a solution. The things that you really want to do if you're getting more rigorous. But that's a perfect example there where we work with the Department of Education to figure out a way to build infrastructure in a field that was lacking, and it's helping us out in a big way. And so, that's why when you hold the interest of population level accountability, the pressure on me was that, if I did the typical things an intermediary does, which is write papers and hold convenings, we actually wouldn't accelerate the work. So when I think about my value add, the promised neighborhoods, it is around accelerating leaders' ability to get results, building evidence, and scaling and sustaining the work. If I'm not helping people do those three things, they don't need to talk to me. And so when you hold a different interest, you will come up with different solutions because you don't have a choice. 
you become really irrelevant quickly. So that's happening. Thank you.